Good afternoon and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. I'm Shaniqua Varun and we're here today to talk about Orion's upcoming distant retrograde departure burn, setting Orion up to exit the distant retrograde orbit, which is which it's been in for the past five days. Orion lifted off atop the Space Launch System from the Kennedy Space Center on November 16th and a planned sp splashdown on December 11th. We're gonna hear from a few folks off the top. They'll give opening remarks and then we'll move on to question and answer session. And those in the room and on the phone bridge will have an opportunity to ask the panelists some questions. To my left, we have Mike Serafin, Artemis One Mission Manager. To his left, we have Zeb Scoville, the Deputy Chief Flight Director. Beside Zeb is Chris Edelin, Edelin, the Deputy Manager for the Orion Vehicle Integration Office. And last on the end is Philippe Delu, the Orion European Service Module Program Manager from ESA. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, well, Mike, I'll toss it over to you to give us a little quick overview of everything Artemis One. Okay, and uh, thank you, Shaniqua, and uh, good afternoon, and thank you for continuing to follow our program. We are on uh, flight day 15 of our Artemis One test flight. Uh, I'll just briefly summarize the uh, activities of the mission management team uh, since I was here uh, to talk to you last. Uh, yesterday, we met for about 35 minutes. We had a uh, non-decisional meeting, and it was largely to synchronize the team. Uh, today, we did have a decisional meeting. It ran for about an hour and 10 minutes, and the uh, decision was part of a pre-planned um, decision gate, and uh, it was to essentially give the go to depart the uh, distant retrograde orbit and start the process of returning Orion home to Earth, and all of our mission management team members pulled go for uh, returning Orion back to the Earth. Uh, if we could pull up the uh, Artemis One mission map, I'll just uh, show where we are relative to our, our overall mission profile and decision gates. Um, you know, uh, November 16th was our, our decision gate to launch uh, the Space Launch System and, and the Orion spacecraft at Bullet One on this uh, test flight, and, then, and we got all the way through the point of translunar injection and headed outbound towards the moon on that green line. Uh, we've completed that, that green line and have entered the um, distant retrograde orbit as part of the um, two maneuver sequence, bullets nine and 10, the outbound powered flyby and the, and the uh, distant retrograde insertion. And we are um, past point 11, the farthest point from Earth. And the uh, decision gate that we uh, discussed today was essentially to reverse that two maneuver sequence and start that blue line to head back towards Earth and our operations team um, has the go to uh, execute that two maneuver sequence, bullets 12 and 13, uh, the distant retrograde departure, which uh, is scheduled as part of um, a planned maneuver on December the 1st in the afternoon, and then uh, followed by the return powered flyby, which is bullet 13, scheduled on December the 5th in the morning. So uh, that will begin the process of, of heading us back towards Earth. We are uh, continuing to collect flight test data and buy down risk uh, for crewed flight. We continue to learn how um, the system is performing, where our margins are, and, and how to operate and, and work with the vehicle as a uh, integrated team. Um, we are, uh, today we did discuss at the mission management team to add uh, more objectives to the return leg. We added uh, four more, what we're calling bonus objectives as part of priority four. And uh, we, we agreed um, to proceed with those. There was one action item coming out of today's mission management team, which was to refine the um, test rationale and um, identify controls associated with the uh, service modules, pressure control assembly, uh, valve cycling test that um, was, was proposed. And, and uh, we're gonna discuss that at, a, uh, at an upcoming um, mission management team meeting. And we've got several days to do that. Uh, we are also starting to include weather in our um, daily daily briefings. Today was the first day that we discussed uh, just the overall weather. Uh, the uh, climatology data is is the best data that we have at this point, and um, the weather uh, forecasts this far out aren't that reliable. But the the uh, actual observed conditions are consistent with the climatology data, uh, and that is actually giving us an early um, look at what the conditions may look like. 
We also reviewed our recovery concept of operations with our uh, recovery operations lead, Melissa Jones, uh, out of the exploration ground systems team, and, and she's uh, uh, on the West Coast working with our U.S. Navy team uh, to, uh, to uh, correct one point from the prior briefing. Um, our uh, recovery con ops uh, has the one well deck ship, two helicopters, uh, four rigid hull inflatable boats. I said two previously, but there's four rigid hull inflatable boats to assist in recovery operations of, of jettisoned items. Uh, two smaller um, uh, rafts, and then um, and then we have a fixed wing aircraft. So we reviewed our uh, re recovery operations and in, in the concept of operations to set up for our splashdown and recovery of the Orion capsule on December the 11th. Uh, the team uh, that is performing the recovery operations is at sea right now performing just-in-time training with the Navy, and they'll return on December the 3rd. If we could roll the uh, Flight Day 14 video images, um, along the way as part of Priority 4, we continue to collect remarkable images and share that with each and every one of you. Uh, this is a view uh, taken yesterday, a video taken yesterday that was, that was downlinked today and uh, it was just cleared for release and shows the um, Orion service module in the, um, in the foreground and one of the solar arrays. Uh, so Orion is, is performing a selfie. Uh, leading the solar array wing, you can see the Earth. And uh, following the solar array wing, you can see the moon. And this, this is just a remarkable image. We can continue to collect those and post those and share those as, as we get, get the, uh, the imagery down. Um, that said, uh, in the foreground there is the European service module, and uh, we could not do uh, this mission without the, our, our European Space Agency partners. Um, I myself uh, was the uh, lead flight director for uh, the uh, launch and delivery of the Columbus module to the International Space Station in 2008. And in the, in the course of flying uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis on that 12-day mission, uh, we honored one of our partnership uh, commitments to the European Space Agency and, and delivered the Columbus module. Uh, and that has been an active part of the, um, of the International Space Station complex since February 2008. Um, ESA has been a, a long-term partner um, many, many decades uh, with NASA, and we are very proud of that partnership. Uh, without the power and the propulsion uh, that the service module provides, uh, we, we simply would not be able to, uh, to execute these missions. So uh, my sincere thanks to Philippe Delu, our European Space Agency Program Manager, who's with us here today. I also want to thank um, the French government and, uh, and uh, President Macron, who visited NASA headquarters earlier today uh, to uh, just discuss ongoing commitments and partnership opportunities with NASA, and uh, we want to thank uh, the French government for their continued participation and partnership as well. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Shanique. Thank you, Mike. And up next, we have uh, Zeb Schofield, the Deputy Chief Flight Director. Good afternoon. So I think Mike did a great job overviewing the mission, and let me just tell you, this has been an incredible mission to fly. Uh, the flight control team is uh, enjoying themselves while they're learning about the vehicle. We're, we're taking it out, uh, really testing it to its limits and trying to understand uh, how it performs and, and how we can learn more about it because this vehicle really needs to be thought of as a human, uh, a human craft that will take humanity to the moon uh, on Artemis two and three and subsequent missions. Uh, we have seen incredible uh, opportunities and, and imagery that impress humanity from rovers on Mars like Perseverance and from the uh, James Webb telescopes and from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiters, and this is not that. Uh, those ones are made for imagery. Those ones are made for geology and sampling. This is a ship that's going to take humans to explore the solar system and cislunar space, and we're just thrilled to be a part of it. Um, when we set our mission goals and objectives pre-launch for this mission, we were um, we had the expectation and the hope that we would be able to complete the mission, complete the trajectory, and get the vehicle to operate and get it down successfully to meet our, our criteria to be able to, to launch Artemis II with people on it. I would say with that, with how well the mission has been going, 
we have found ourselves, rather than having to work anomalies, we're able to push the boundaries. And so with this, we are expanding the box, which allows us to tie and anchor analysis that we have that may have had some uncertainty with actual test and flight data, so that now the, the constraints and the limitations that we have or the ability to understand the risks that we put our crew members in on Artemis II can be reduced. And so with this, things like um, pushing the, some of the thrusters to longer duration burns. In fact, we just completed one several minutes ago uh, that, that was our longest duration burn out of the RCS system. Uh, we're, we're using attitudes of the vehicle to get different thermal uh, properties on the vehicle, and all of that is, is, is telling us about the performance of, of the thermal systems, about the camera systems, the navigation systems, again, so we can know how is this going to work. If we have problems when the crew is there, how can we rely on the rest of the systems on the vehicle to take capability that may have been beyond what we considered our certification box going into Artemis One, And so that is all in the name of, of getting us in the best posture for humans to go back. A little bit of, um, a little bit about the upcoming maneuvers that uh, Mike talked about. We have the distant retrograde departure burn. That is going to be uh, tomorrow afternoon, Thursday at 3.55 p.m. That's a minute and 45 second burn, and that basically takes us out of the distant retrograde orbit uh, and brings us on a close trajectory to the moon. Uh, as we swing by the moon, we're going to do a uh, return powered flyby. This will actually be the longest burn out of the Ohms engine that we have. This is going to be a three minute and 27 second burn. And actually, uh, throughout this mission, we've sort of been flying in a Earth moon plane. This maneuver is actually going to bring us out of plane down uh, lower. Uh, across the, the, the lower section of the moon, which then has us bring and dip up as we re-enter into the uh, Pacific from on a south to north trajectory is generally how that, how that arc is going to work. Um, as we fly by the moon, the lighting will be a little bit different from what we saw with the outbound power flyby. The, the imagery that we saw on that day was absolutely gobsmacking, and I was just taking pictures all day and, and looking up in awe at what we saw. And so, so let me talk a little bit about what, this, what we're going to see this time. Um, as we come in here, you can see the trajectory um, coming in from the left of the screen, and the, the face of the moon that faces Earth is what we will see lit up. So we'll see familiar features, um, the man on the moon perhaps, and, and more specifically the, the um, craters and uh, lava beds in the mare that we went and explored during the Apollo program. Uh, however, if you can, as you can see in this graphic, uh, the part of the trajectory that is over those specific sites will be pretty far away from the moon. It's actually about 6,000 miles above the surface when we will be uh, passing over some of those Apollo sites. We will then dip behind the moon, and that's where we'll have our closest approach. Um, that closest approach will, will have a loss of signal again um, of about uh, 40 minutes. Um, and that will be as, as Orion goes into the eclipse and, and darkness. Uh, then we'll pop out of the backside and be able to uh, be on a trajectory back towards uh, the, the west coast of the U.S. off of Los Angeles and coming into um, the Pacific there. Uh, I think that's all I've had. And, and Chris, I can hand it to you. Okay, thanks, Zeb. Yeah, uh, as Zeb said, we, we continue to be very pleased with the performance of the Orion, Orion spacecraft on the mission so far. So uh, again, with the extra bandwidth the team has, because we're not you know, working uh, any major issues, we've been able to add several additional uh, flight test objectives to the DRO portion of the mission. Uh, so we added seven and just completed the final two uh, additional objectives uh, of, of the distant retrograde orbit. We just completed those two with the burn that Zeb mentioned. So for that burn, we did a uh, approximately 100 second uh, burn with the plus X or auxiliary thrusters because the previous burns had only been about 17 seconds maximum. So by burning a longer period of time, we were able to uh, achieve a thermal equilibrium in the, in the thrusters and then measure the temperatures uh, in that part of the propulsion system to compare that against ground testing because obviously uh, the space environment is very difficult to replicate in ground testing. So we want to take advantage to the maximum extent possible of the space environment to, again, test out and try out our, our, all of our spacecraft systems. As part of the, uh, that OM3 burn that just occurred, we also looked at radiant heating on the adjacent solar arrays so we could see, uh, you know, again, verify our thermal models uh, so we can uh, hopefully reduce some constraints on solar array positioning during burns. One of the other uh, focuses of our additional flight test objectives over the past 24 hours 
was the uh, expansion of our or uh, assessing the expansion of our attitude envelope. Normally, Orion flies with, uh, with the tail to the sun. That's our best thermal attitude. It provides the best power generation for our solar arrays. For, uh, for Artemis 1, we're flying a very tight two by four degree uh, uh, box, very tight uh, constraints, again, because this is the first flight. But uh, yesterday, we were able to fly three different five hour periods in different parts of the broader 20 degree, plus or minus 20 degree uh, design envelope for that tail to sun attitude. So again, that'll give us the ability to, uh, to uh, hof hopefully uh, expand our operational envelope on future missions and also to see how our heaters respond uh, in those attitudes. It, it, it's, it's probably not the most glamorous part of space flight, but heaters and analyzing your uh, you know, thermal performance of your spacecraft is very important because as you can imagine, uh, you, you don't want any valves to, to seize up in the cold of space or have uh, propellant lines or water lines freeze and potentially burst. So it's very important that we uh, get good data on the thermal environment in these different attitudes, different orient orientations of the spacecraft, as well as the heaters tend to be uh, big power hogs. They are the big, one of the biggest uh, impacts to our power usage. So by flying different attitudes, we're better able to analyze what our power usage is and hopefully free up some power for future missions. So uh, we can go ahead and roll, uh, roll the, uh, the, time, the transit uh, time-lapse video. And uh, this was taken on Monday when Orion was the furthest point from the Earth. And you can see uh, the Earth passing behind the moon there. This again is a, is a time-lapse video. The reason the Earth and Moon are moving about in the sky is because uh, Orion is not pointed at a constant point in the sky. We're flying that attitude dead band that I talked about. So unlike uh, James Webb and Hubble Space Telescopes, again, we don't point at a precise point in the sky, but in order to save propellant, uh, we allow the spacecraft to move around a bit. So that's one of the additional uh, detailed flight test objectives that we'll be doing uh, again, uh, as part of our return phase of the mission, is looking at different attitude control modes, different uh, digital autopilot settings to try to um, uh, determine if we can save propellant while we're holding attitude, different dead bands, different uh, control parameters. So these are all things that we're going to do to, uh, again, give us more operational margin uh, on future missions and uh, provide more capability. So um, before I conclude, I, I do want to mention um, uh, the, I wanted to describe the team from Orion that's supporting the mission. We have uh, engineers from the program that are working in the Mission Evaluation Room, or MER, in the Mission Control Center. And uh, these are uh, folks from NASA, from our prime contractor, Lockheed Martin, as well as from the European Space Agency. And uh, they all bring uh, a wealth of knowledge. They're t typically, these are engineers that have years of experience either designing uh, parts of the Orion spacecraft, uh, in some cases building it and checking out and testing the components, writing the software. So again, uh, they, they bring a wealth of, of, of deep knowledge. And during the mission, we support the MER 24-7, working closely with our flight operations counterparts and assessing the vehicle performance. Uh, in many cases, it's comparing how well Orion is performing on orbit compared to ground testing. In some cases, we may see little glitches, little, uh, uh, we, we call them funnies in the data. We'll assess that, look to see if we can determine, is there anything we need to be worried about? Is there anything we need to change in terms of design, assembly, or testing? Or is it just this is the way the hardware is going to work, so it'll, it'll influence and uh, uh, give us you know, data information that we need for the flights going forward. And of course, for, uh, for a couple of the anomalies that, that, uh, that Mike's described over the past few briefings, uh, the MER has been an essential part working with the flight operations team, again, to assess the, uh, assess the anomaly, what, what impacts they'll have on the mission, uh, and then to go back and look at uh, detailed ground testing to see if we can tease out what's the root cause of some of these anomalies, or in the case uh, of the star tracker, for example, we learned that this is actually how the system is going to function in the flight environment. So again, we're learning a lot in the MER, uh, working with uh, with our European colleagues who are who are an integral part of the MER. Uh, we have uh, actually 17 engineers from uh, from Europe, engineers and managers that that came to Houston that are participating in the MER, uh, sitting side by side with their U.S. colleagues. So just as uh, Orion could not fly without the European service module, we could not fly this mission without the expertise of our European colleagues. 
So with that, uh, Shaniqua, we'll back to you. Thank you, Chris. And lastly, we'll hear from Philippe Deleu, the European Service Module Program Manager from ESA. Thank you. So good afternoon or good evening if you are watching us from Europe. So it's not obvious when you look at the pictures uh, which are broadcasted that there is a significant European contribution to this vehicle. Uh, as Mike said, the service module has been built in Europe and the service module is providing critical function, uh, indispensable for Orion to fulfill its need. Uh, the propulsion which, is, uh, which has put uh, Orion in this moon orbit, the distant retrograde moon orbit, um, the uh, thermal control, which provides the rejection in order, in order, the heat rejection, in order to provide a crew with, when they will be a crew, with a uh, proper, adequate atmosphere to live in. Um, but also to keep all the system thermally uh, at their operational temperature uh, and ensure their function. And another big one, which is the electrical power generation through the solar arrays and the distribution to the rest of the module. So we are very proud of uh, that our system is functioning perfectly. Uh, it's even better than we ever expected. It's uh, uh, beyond the performance uh, we expected. As probably has been said before, the, the propellant margin have kept increasing throughout the mission through the excellent uh, performance of the system. We are rich in power. The solar array produce more power, uh, about 15% more power than uh, planned, and the consumption is less. And the consumption is less because basically the thermal environment is much more benign uh, in turn, internal to the spacecraft that we had foreseen. So this is one of the big lessons learned uh, for us in the design of the spacecraft is that the interior of the uh, service module, uh, the temperature is much more stable than what we initiated. That's, that's what we have learned here. Uh, in space with this mission, and it's a big lesson learned because, as Chris said, if it's the the temperature is much more stable inside, you need less power to activate the heaters to eat items that would be too cold, and if you eat less power, you have much more power for other things. So it's a, it's an essential lesson learned. Also, we have. Uh, the regulation of the propulsion system has been our troubled child uh, throughout the development and it has just worked beautifully. No, no problem whatsoever with this uh, propulsion system and we hope that's going to continue uh, like this also for the big burns and all the trajectory correction burns that will happen uh, up to the return of the vehicle. As Chris said, uh, yes, we have many engineers here, but we have also an uh, engineer following the mission real time in Europe. We have a control center in Europe uh, with engineers taking over, uh, let's say, taking part in the 24 hour shifts. Uh, and I have to say, there's been a great collaboration between all the teams. Uh, when you see a picture of them, they work together side by side. There's no competition, but there's only one objective, get the most successful mission we can have. And finally, I would like to conclude by saying that ESA is on board for the uh, big adventure that we're starting with Artemis 1. Uh, Artemis 1 is just the first a test flight of a series of uh, a future mission. Um, the Artemis 2 is already, sorry, not the Artemis 2, but the service module 2 is already in Kennedy, uh, being prepared for the Artemis 2 mission. And the following service modules up to ESM 6 uh, are being built in Europe. And last year, sorry, last week, sorry, not last year, our ministers have approved the funding to start the manufacturing of the service module for the Artemis 7 and 9 missions. So we are really on board with NASA in order to make this exploration to the moon, to Mars and beyond a success. And uh, I was very pleased to hear that uh, President Macron uh, was visiting NASA today uh, and was, uh, let's say, presented the success 
of this mission. With that, I will give you back the... Thank you so much. Thanks to all our briefers for those initial remarks. As a reminder, we'll be taking questions on the phone bridge and here in the room. Please press star one to add your name to the queue to ask a question. If you're on, on the phone bridge and press star two if your question happens to get answered. Once your name is called, please state your name, affiliation, and to whom you'd like to direct your question. Let's start here in the room. We have Gina Sansari from ABC. Thank you. Let me start with Philippe. What does this bonus in power mean for future designs? What is the bonus? Well, if you have 15% uh, more power, so 15, um, there can always be degradation. You're in space, you have solar rays that are exposed to micrometeorites, so there is also uh, the risk that you lose some of the power because of an accident. Having more power from the start allow you to uh, survive those conditions in, in a much better uh, way. And what is that? When uh, Orion goes on the dark side of the moon and is uh, out of communications, how close is it getting to the surface on that pass? Yeah, thank you. So the um, closest approach distance is going to be 79.2 statute miles as it dips down uh, on its um, return leg to, to Earth. All right, and we'll go to the phone bridge now. Um, uh, first up is Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Yes, hi, good evening. Um, from Microsab. Uh, when you leave orbit tomorrow, does that put you on course for a December 11 splashdown no matter what? I'm just wondering if that's a point of no return once you fire the engines, there's no going back and hanging around at the moon any longer. And um, how much wiggle room will you have in and around the splashdown site if bad weather pops up? Thanks. Um, yep. Okay. Either, right. either way is that. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the... the um, Return powered flyby burn commits us to uh, returning uh, um, back to the Earth, obviously. And there is a little bit of, of uh, modification we can have in terms of the timing, but it's on the order of hours, not days. Um, and, and that is managed through a series of um, return correction uh, trajectory burns that we can uh, modify that slightly. Uh, we're going to be looking at weather, as, as Mike started to say, on the days leading up to the return uh, powered flyby. And that's really what commits us um, to the trajectory path, as I mentioned, how that uh, lowers the trajectory and, and so that we dip down out of the plane and then come up from the, from the south to the north towards the, the west coast of the United States. And that, that picks our time. And so we're, we're going to be looking at what the weather systems are like off of the coast. And there is some variability that we can have on different trajectory lines. Basically, by how much we dip down will affect how much we approach from the south or more from the west. Um, so we can target uh, different um, approach vectors into, into the coast uh, to pick the best uh, weather and timing. Um, and then there's also lengths along that trajectory where we can land short or extend the the reentry to be able to land a little bit longer, so we have some variability on the landing track. Thanks, Marsha. Next up, we'll have uh, Alicia Sawyers from Mashable. Good. Try to make this sort of simple for me um, in terms of explaining why that maneuver allow for a more precise way of landing than the previous methods used, uh, you know, for Apollo flights. Hey, Alicia, we lost part of your question. Could you repeat for us? Sure. Sorry about that. Um, I was hoping that someone could sort of talk me through the skip entry and explain why that maneuver allows for a more precise way of uh, landing versus the methods that were used for Apollo flights. Yeah. Um, Alicia, thank you for the question. Um, and, and Zeb can uh, add anything here. But it, it's, um, it's not necessarily about precision. It is about the uh, G-forces, the skip reentry that we're uh, performing during um, the Artemis program using Orion. Um, actually has a lower G profile uh, because we bleed the energy off um, through the course of two dips into the Earth's atmosphere. 
the uh, systems today, however, are far more precise than what we flew in the Apollo program. So uh, the, the precision of the landing simply through the guidance and nav and, and flight control systems that we have on this vehicle are more precise as a result of that. But um, the skip reentry profile is, is, is not specific to precision. It's specific to the, uh, the uh, uh, gravitational uh, or deceleration force on the spacecraft. I don't know, Zeb, if you have anything to add on that. Yeah, I, I think that covers it pretty well. The only thing we can do is uh, affect how much we skip out um, so that we, we can have sort of the two dips in the atmosphere be spread apart more, we can bring them closer together, um, or even come in almost ballistically to, so that does allow us, as I said, that variability along that ground track to pick our, our precise landing site. But but the driver is really getting some of the, the G profile and the heating to be uh, as we want on the vehicle for reentry. Yeah, and, and I'll just add for a comparison to Apollo, Apollo was just strictly a direct entry, so they, pretty much your landing site was set uh, earlier on when you departed the moon with just only you know, minor bit ability to, to adjust that. But the, the really one of the major advances with, uh, with Artemis uh, is that, the, again, as, as uh, Zeb and Mike have described, the spacecraft has the ability to, uh, to perform a skip entry to steer up and out of, the, you know, out of the denser part of the atmosphere, glide further downrange or less downrange so that you can pick the best landing site within that you know, couple thousand miles of, uh, of downrange steering capability. Thanks, Alicia. Next up, we'll have a question from Jeff Faust, Space News. Uh, good afternoon. Question probably for Mike Serafin. You mentioned these four additional bonus objectives. I'm curious if you could outline what those four objectives are, and where are you now in terms of percentage of completion of the overall mission objectives and the percentage still in progress? Thanks. Yeah, Jeff, thank you for the question. Um, the uh, additional objectives uh, in all of these are um, going to occur after we exit the distant retrograde orbit um, are, uh, let me find my notes here real quick. Um, we are going to cycle and um, monitor the leak rates on the pressure control assembly. So this is the helium um, that is used to pressurize the propellant tanks. Um, just to uh, understand the uh, the leak rate uh, that occurs uh, as, as we as we cycle these valves. Understanding that over the course of longer and longer duration missions is very important. Um, and once we get the, um, the propulsion system after the return powered flyby on December the 5th in what they call blowdown where you don't need pressurization uh, to augment um, pressurization of the tanks affords us an opportunity to understand that. Um, we are also looking at a, um, a uh, increased attitude maneuver rate uh, to basically uh, pitch the vehicle at uh, up to four degrees uh, per second. Um, and and then um, the last objective, <laughs> i got to find my notes. Um, yeah, we're going to fly, uh, uh, we're going to fly part of the mission in a three-doff. Uh, three yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so we, yeah. yeah, we, we normally, we, normally when we hold attitude with Orion, the, the the autopilot is very sophisticated when it fires thrusters to hold attitude. It makes sure that there's not an, you know, a, a translation effect. So you, you don't have any uncoupled thruster firings. So we've got a, a, a different attitude control mode that loosens that up a little bit. It allows small translations as, a, as an artifact of the attitude control. Uh, so we're going to try that out in order to determine how much that perturbs the trajectory. And if that works, if it's a small effect, uh, we'll go ahead and accept that those uh, slightly greater perturbations because holding attitude in a three, three degree of freedom mode, uh, we expect to be a, a, a say, we'll say propellant. Of course, that propellant then comes in handy for maneuvers or other uh, mission objectives. Yeah, and, um, and Jeff, uh, in terms of the uh, completion status, so the uh, seven bonus objectives that we added uh, the last time we came and talked to you, all those are complete. Uh, the last two were completed just as we uh, started this this uh, this call with you. Um, and then of the 124 baseline objectives, uh, we don't have a an update uh, to those. We still have 37.5% uh, that are in progress, 37.5% uh, that are still in front of us, and, and then the remainder um, is complete. And then, of course, we added the, uh, the four bonus objectives here. So um, we continue to, to uh, gather data on some of those objectives. Some of them have, you know, six, eight, ten data takes, um, and we're somewhere, you know, north of five data takes on some of those. So that's why you're seeing some of those is, is what we call pending or, or in progress. 
Thank you for your question, Jeff. Next up, we have Alexandra Weitz from Nature Magazine. Hi, it's Alex with you from Nature. My question is for Chris. I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about conditions within the Orion capsule itself. What are some of the environmental conditions? What would it be like for astronauts in there? And some of the cool kids have been playing with Callisto remotely. Have you tried using Callisto to control um, some major functions for Orion? Yeah, yeah, Callisto's a lot of fun. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get to take a selfie, uh, you know, f from the other side of the moon. So that was pretty neat uh, for my wife and I to have that selfie. Uh, and a, a, a colleague of mine, uh, we were in a meeting and we saw birthday greetings uh, again from Callisto uh, from on board Orion. Someone had, uh, had written that on the whiteboard. So that's uh, that's a pretty fun uh, feature. Uh, again, is to demonstrate some of this uh, uh, future type systems that the crew could use to maintain good situational awareness of the spacecraft system. So it's good we're getting to demonstrate that capability. So for Artemis One. Um, you know, the, the crew cabin environment is not being maintained, you know, at the required level for human habitation. The temperature is normally around, uh, it's been around, you know, the mid-50s, so it's a little on the cool side, especially for those of us from Houston. So um, we're not actually flying the, uh, the atmospheric revitalization system, the life support systems on this flight. We do maintain a pressurized environment, again, a you know, reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable temperature for the systems to operate, but we're not really testing uh, the life support components on this flight. That's going to be the big objective for Artemis II. When we fly the crew, we will be flying, uh, again, the, uh, the, the air revitalization system, the CO2 scrubbers, uh, the food systems, the water supply systems. So all of that will be uh, the first flight for those systems on Artemis II. Thank you. And next question we have is from Robert Perlman from Collect Space. Hi. Um, I think from Mike Serafin, but um, looking at the different type of flight profiles that were based on the launch date, you could have been in DRO for up to, I guess, 19 days. Um, what if this had been the longer profile, what more would you have been doing to, in addition to what you've done over the, over the six days that you actually have? Or what are we missing by only being in DRO for six days? Yeah, Robert, thank you for the question. In terms of the flying a shorter class mission, uh, roughly 26 days as opposed to one of the longer class missions that afforded us um, better launch availability, um, and, and those longer class missions were somewhere between like 38 and 42 days. It, it's in the margins. It, it is fewer data takes uh, that we get. So as I, as I um, mentioned earlier, when, when Jeff asked the question about uh, completion status of the, uh, of the uh, priority two, demonstrate the vehicle in the flight environment and priority four uh, bonus objectives, we continue to gather more data using the same sensors, but at a different distance from Earth, at, at a, dis, a different distance from the moon, and um, under different um, attitude uh, and thermal condition, um, thermal conditions. So it's just fewer data takes. We, the more data that we gather, the better we're able to understand the margins, um, understand, uh, you know, certain uh, uh, system interactions and, and system performances, and then uh, use that to inform our uh, plans on future missions, but also validate our models or or show uh, that for, uh, I, I like the example that Chris gave about the, uh, the thermal um, uh, attitude uh, uh, expansion. You know, Orion wants to fly uh, tail the sun, but we've got a 20, 20 degree by 20 degree box that uh, the spacecraft wants to uh, stay within, and, and it's very happy there. It's it's uh, thermally stable and from a power system standpoint. So what we did was we flew it over the box on one corner. It normally wants to fly slightly off center, and we flew it to the opposite corner, and then we flew it to the middle. And and one of the things that we learned in, in that case is one of the camera controllers gets pretty hot on the crew module adapter, uh, so we had to power the camera controller off. Um, but Overall, uh, the system is performing as expected um, from a from a sp overall spacecraft standpoint. And as Philippe alluded to earlier, you know the the cooling system, the power system, the 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 uh, propellant consumption all continue to exceed our expectations. But when you find something like a camera camera controller getting hot, 
Now you can factor that into your upcoming plans because if you needed that camera for, for an operation or for an imagery um, uh, data take, now you can factor that in because it is going to get hot um, for a specific period of time. So it, again, it's uh, the uh, difference between a short class and a long class mission is it's in the margins of additional data takes. Um, we're not finding any any huge surprises. The, the surprises that we are having are, are pleasant surprises in terms of the system is exceeding our performance and, and we continue to, to build that confidence that this is our deep space human transportation system and, um, and it, is, it is meeting or exceeding expectations across the board. Thank you, Robert, for your question. Next up, we have a, call, a question from David Curley from the Discovery Channel. A personality traits to give us a sense, a description of how this uh, spacecraft lies, how it acts. David, we might have lost part of your question. Um, would you repeat it for us? I'll try again. Yeah, I'll happily try again. It's for Zeb. I was asking if um, you're, you're trying to learn how this spacecraft acts, uh, how it performs. Can you assign any personality traits to Orion to give us a sense of how it flies, how it performs? Thank you. Yeah, David, thank you. Uh, good to hear your voice again. Um, you know, a lot of times when, you know, to use a, a terrestrial analogy, when you think about uh, getting a car and driving it for the first time, you know, is it going to be a 40-year-old clunker or is it going to be a highly tuned, you know, example of precision engineering and, and the latest in, in control and, and human interfaces? Um, I would, I would um, put it closer to, to the latter in the spectrum. Um, I, uh, I, we all came into the mission expecting to have challenges, and we and the team went through a lot of simulations and tests to be ready for the bad days. And we sit there, and instead, it's kind of purring along and staying very smooth. Um, and the the kinds of discussions we were having are how to rev the engine a little bit harder and how to really really push it uh, a little bit harder and faster. And you know, if you if you get a a new car and, and you take it for a test drive, you know, that's what really gets your heart pumping, that's what gets you excited, and, and if I put a personality on it, it's more like that. Thank you for your question, David. Next up, we have a question from Mark Carew, Aviation Week, Space Tech. Um, could you give us the times and the duration for the burns that are planned tomorrow, December the 1st, and December the 5th. And also, if you have a projected splashdown time, um, I realize some of this can change, of course, but I'd like to know what you know now. I got those for you. Um, so the uh, distant retrograde departure burn is going to be Thursday, about uh, 3.55 p.m. Central Time. It's going to be a 4,000 or sorry, uh, 454 uh, feet per second burn, and that'll take uh, one minute and 45 seconds. The return powered flyby will be Monday about 10 a.m. Central. It'll be the uh, 961 foot per second burn, and that's three minutes and 27 seconds. And as I said earlier, that's the uh, longest burn we'll have done on the mission with the, with the Ohms engine. And then your last question was for splashdown. That'll be Sunday. Uh, December 11th, approximately 11 a.m. As you said, there's going to be some variability as the as we manage the the trajectory corrections and as we look at precision weather. Thank you, Mark. And I think we have another question from Marsha Dunn. Um, Marsha, with the Associated Press, you are ready to go. Yes. Hi. Probably for Zeb. Um, when you showed the map picture, you showed all six uh, Apollo landing sites, and I'm wondering which of those. Is Orion going to be um, passing over most directly, albeit 6,000 feet, uh, 6,000 miles above? Um, and, and given that distance, I'm going to assume that uh, we're not going to see any footprints, right? I'm joking. No, I mean, will, will we be able to make out anything whatsoever? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Marcia. So uh, it's Apollo 12 and 14 landing sites that we're actually going to be flying closest to. As we said, it's... Um, 
a pretty high distance off of, off of the surface as we go by. We are absolutely going to be pointing cameras at that area. Um, but you know, these are essentially a GoPro camera, and, and as we said, we're 6,000 miles away. If you can imagine being in Houston and, and pointing a, a GoPro in Paris and, and trying to uh, see, the, see a, a Volkswagen bus there, you're not going to see it. Um, but you know, there are um, a lot of geological features with, with craters um, near those sites, and we will be able to make out uh, uh, large features of the moon that we will be able to retroactively go back and identify sort of what those were. But there was a lot of uh, optical navigation imagery that I think has gotten out to the public that people may have seen. It'll be that kind of le level of resolution is what we're talking about as we go by. And so it'll be more of a tip of the hat and a historical um, uh, nod to the past as we fly this spaceship to the future and, and get set to bring humans to the South Pole. Thank you for your question, Marcia. And we do have a few more minutes. If you would like to ask a question or another question, um, please press star one on the phone bridge and we will get you in the queue. And we have one more in the room with Gina Sanceri from ABC. Um, Mike, you didn't talk about any funnies today. Were there any funnies today? Yeah, um, Gina, I, w I would say the, you know, the one, the one, uh, I, I don't know that I would call this necessarily a funny. It was a finding from the from the uh, thermal uh, envelope expansion um, attitude uh, 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 test that we did. Was we we found that the camera gets hot on the on the crew module adapter uh, when we when we fly a specific attitude. Um, in terms of um, additional funnies. The only other thing that that is still out there is we have this on the um, on the power system, as we previously previously discussed the the power conditioning and uh, distribution unit. Uh, there's something called the latching um, uh, current limiter. We did have another occurrence of an uncommanded open um, event, so we're up to nine occurrences on that. Uh, the anomaly resolution team is still reviewing that. We we. Um, are, are working a fault tree uh, to understand what the hardware is telling us. The uh, redundancy and the levels of redundancy that we have on the spacecraft combined with the fact that every single one of these um, is, is uh, no impact or recovering from it, um, you know, is, is not really a, um, a concern as it pertains to our ability to achieve this mission. We're just trying to understand if there's something there that uh, we need to consider in future builds. So that, that's really all, all that's out there. And, and Chris, you're our engineering um, uh, lead from a from a Orion spacecraft standpoint. Is there anything else out there no, that you the, could the, think the, of? That, like I say, things have been very smooth with the spacecraft. So I would agree with Zeb that this is a if this is a new car you purchase, you're going to be very happy that it's uh, uh, you know it's drama free uh, so far and uh, exceeding expectations. I, I would call it overachieving. Yeah. <laughs> We appreciate you, sir, for overachieving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, we do have another question. Um, Ken Kramer from Space Up Close. Hi, thanks for taking my question and, and for doing this. Uh, my question is for Philippe, I believe. I think uh, you have six Ohms engines, I believe. I was wondering, uh, can you tell us the status of the preparations and also what what is the plan Beyond those six, are you building uh, uh, new thrusters? Will they be more capable? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ken, for the question. So it's true there are still six Ohms engines. Uh, those engines, as you know, are shuttles engines, so they are NASA. They are sent to us. So what we do, we integrate uh, the engine in, in our systems. Um, and uh, for what will be uh, starting from the service module number seven, uh, there will be a new engine called the OME, which is uh, a build to print uh, that Aerojet will do of the Ohms engine. So this, this engine is now in the development, is, gone through, is going through the uh, preliminary design review at the moment, and uh, that should be the successor of the OMZ engine. Thank you. We have another question from Alicia Sowers, um, Mashable. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm new at this. Uh, Mike, maybe could you explain for me what exactly is a funny? <laughs> how, do you, how do you define that and how is that different from like an anomaly? Yeah, Alicia, thank you for the question. Um, a, a funny is, uh, 
something that that we we put on the on the wall on the marker board in the uh, in the mission evaluation room, and we decide what does it mean. We don't quite understand what it means right now. Um, some things are clearly failures uh, if if the uh, fault detection and isolation uh, kicks in, and, and or uh, some of the uh, automatic self test hardware uh, says you know I'm not working properly, throws up uh, you know the avionics box throws its hand in the air and says you know don't count on me kind of thing. That that's a that's a failure. Um, and a, a funny is something. Uh, you know, like like this camera controller getting too hot um, that we put on the on the board, and we just track it and make sure that we understand um, that uh, that through further further work on the ground that we understand what it means. I don't, Chris, if if you have anything to add to yeah, that, yeah, I think that's a pretty good description. I I would just add that it, you know, a funny would be could be simply something you didn't expect. Uh, you know, we go into the mission with uh, with simulations, with ground testing, with analysis, so that predicts how a system will perform. Then in the real world, you might see some, you know, slight deviation from, from what you expected. That's why we call them a funny, and you sort of go and look at that, and you, maybe you go back and look at the ground testing to see if there's any indication or, or some interaction between systems in, in the flight environment or some other environmental effect that would cause that. But certainly we, we, we look at the funnies very closely within the MER. We work with our flight control team, uh, the, the flight controller counterparts, to understand is that a sign of some impending failure or is it just the way the system works? So it's, it's good to get the runtime on, on orbit and in flight in order to see how the systems perform. Thank you for that question. Next up, we have the last question we'll take for today, and that's coming from David Curley from the Discovery Channel. Thanks again. Um, I guess this actually could have been for the next briefing. Um, on heat shields, and I don't know if this is you, Mike Serafin, or not, uh, you talked about the skip reentry and blowing off uh, some of the G-forces, which are also blowing off some of the speed. And is part of it to aid in the performance of the heat shields? or just the G-forces? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm following the, the question, David. Um, are, are you asking specifically about the, um, the skip reentry and, and what that means to the heat shield? Can you clarify, please? Yes, does it actually help uh, the, for the performance of the heat shields to do the skip? Um, <sighs> <laughs> we're getting into um, we're getting into aerodynamics and aerothermal uh, sciences here, and and that is a, a PhD level topic, um, first of all, um, and and I'm I'm enough to be dangerous on that topic, but I'm I'm certainly not an expert in the, in the uh, hypersonic uh, aerothermal conditions. Um, the the heat put into the system needs to to come back out of the system. And there's a couple of ways to do it. You can, you can just come straight in like we did in Apollo and take it all, all, all out at once. And what that does is it creates a very high um, uh, heat impulse. If you, if you come in through a skip reentry, what that does is it spreads that out over a longer period of time so that the heat impulse is not nearly as high. Um, in terms of aerodynamics, it's really the area under the curve. That all that area, all that heat, needs to come out under the curve. It's just a matter of how flat the curve is or whether it peaks. Um, and that's, that's probably the best description that I can, I can give to you um, on the, uh, on the uh, skip reentry. It, it is a flatter curve. Um, it, all, it is also flatter from a, a G-force standpoint, but it is a longer period of time where we have um, the, uh, the heat coming out of the system as well as the G-forces. I don't, I don't know, Chris, if you have anything to add no, on that one. I think that, that was a good explanation. I would just say it's, it's the skip entry is, is probably more benign, as Mike described, from a heat rate, the, with that spike that Mike discussed. Uh, but it's, it's a greater heat load, the integrated heat that's building up in the system over time because it's a longer entry. So it's, a, it's ben more benign in some ways and more difficult in others. Thank you, and that was our last question for today. Uh, thanks to all who submitted questions, and thanks to today's briefers for taking the time to discuss the DRD burn and the departure from the distant retrograde orbit. We'll be covering the DRD burn tomorrow, live on air. That'll begin around 3.30 p.m. That'll begin at 3.30 p.m. Central Time, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. 
with a burn targeted at 3.54 p.m. Central Time, 4.54 p.m. Eastern Time. And be sure to follow along with our daily blog posts as Orion continues its journey to the moon and beyond at blogs.nasa.gov forward slash Artemis. Thanks again for joining us. That will wrap up, our t wrap up today's briefing.